thank you very much for uh, inviting me. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, a large-scale, long-term effort with uh, a lot of collaborators um, that's ongoing. Um, I'm trying to reduce some, some marvelous theory from, from the late 1980s and 1990s and making it uh, work in practice. And please ask if you have questions. Um, so there are going to be three parts, a little bit of a motivating discussion, high level, then uh, theory, um, some models and theoretical questions, and then back to um, high level discussion. The problem I'm talking about, so I don't need this. The problem I'm talking about, um, I'll call it computational integrity and privacy. And it's also known uh, using a bunch of other names, such as checking, certifying, and so on, uh, computations. And, and it's really a pair of problems. So um, we have a party that is executing some computer program on a mixture of public and private data. And um, often this party has an incentive to cheat about uh, the output of the computation because it could benefit from misreporting, misreporting the output. And there is another problem of um, privacy, which is that that party may wish to preserve parts of its input as, as private. So uh, here are a few examples. I mean, tax reporting is one example where I have an incentive to cheat about and uh, misreport the output. Uh, insurance claim processing, I could uh, try to get a loan by proving that I have more funds than I really have. Um, and this is all particularly relevant if we think about a world where we don't assume trust and, and identities, um, as is now um, the case with uh, decentralized cryptocurrencies. And we'll get back to this point. So you really want to use crypto um, to, to, to get assurances of correct computation. And um, you probably know that zero-knowledge proofs and arguments and, and interactive proof systems offer a marvelous uh, solution to both of these problems. Um, but they do so asymptotically as the problem size goes to infinity. And what we care about is what happens for small instance sizes as, the, as may arise actually in, in standard computation. So let's get a little bit more formal. Uh, the language that we'll talk about is this language. So its inputs are quadruples, um, a computer program could be assembly code or some Turing machine, um, a running time specified in, in, in binary, and that's the number of cycles. And then you have an input and an output, and the claim or the instances in the language are those of the following form. Um, there exists, uh, it's a non-deterministic computation, meaning you could insert uh, non-deterministic witnesses that capture uh, you know, passwords or private information. And the claim uh, um, is that um, I started with this public input, x, and I ran for at most t cycles, and I ended up with this output. Okay? It's not hard to see that because t is given in binary, this is actually next uh, non-exponential time, a non-deterministic exponential time complete. You can reduce to and from the bounded halting problem. Um, but this is also, I think, a very intuitive way of, of talking about very general computation. So any, almost, I mean, many, many computer um, or programs can be thought of as, as, or claims using computer programs can be thought of as in this form. <coughs> a proof system, again, informally, there are, of course, many, many variants of them, is, is really a pair of algorithms, a verifier and a prover. Um, with three properties, and they interact. They send messages back and forth, and they may use randomness. And uh, there are three important properties. The first is efficiency of the verifier. The verifier is randomized polynomial time. Completeness means that if x is in a language, um, then there exists a way to convince the verifier that x is in the language. And if x is not in the language, then any prover, even with unbounded computational power, will fail um, in convincing the verifier with probability half. So I have a question. Yes. If I look at your previous example of cheating on your taxes, for example, it seems that you are cheating about your input uh, x, and rather than about whether you computed it correctly or incorrectly. So how do you fit between your examples and the model? Right. So um, this solves the. We'll talk about solutions for the prob problem of computational integrity. There is a separate problem that is that of uh, spoofing the input. So how do we know that the inputs are with assurance? Um, I would say that um, 
again, as we move, let's say, towards a world where you get data signed by other parties, you would need collusion from further parties to sort of, uh, you know, you're going to, the input to your tax return would be receipts that are digitally signed, let's say, by some other parties, and now you need their collusion. But, uh, uh, you know, this is not going to solve, uh, right, uh, fraud uh, anytime soon or ever, right? There's always going to be a way around. So we're, we're going to be closing or trying to close one particular uh, avenue of cheating, which is during the computation. Okay. Um, so an argument system, which will be more relevant to what we're implementing, is similar to a proof system, but the prover is now also bounded. And again, this is more realistic uh, um, in common settings. Okay. And here's a um, sort of a compression of many spectacular results from the late 1980s and 19, early 1990s. So this is, as you see, a, a, lot of, uh, a lot of work went into showing this particular thing. Um, this language, CI, computational integrity, which is next complete, has a pretty good uh, argument system. So you can make it non-interactive, which means that the prover just sends a proof. Um, that you can check offline. And this requires some setup or a random oracle, and we'll talk about that later. But practically speaking, you know, it's, it's not that hard to set it up such a thing. Um, it's a succinct system, meaning that the verifier's running time is polynomial only in the size of the instance, let's say the computer program, and logarithm of the running time. So it does, in particular, the verifier does not need to re-execute re the program. Uh, another thing is that it's sort of a transparent verification process. So the whole setup of the system and the verification, the verifier messages are all public random coins. And again, if you think about this in the context of, let's say, a blockchain or a decentralized network, this is something very valuable. And of course, it's zero knowledge, so the proof uh, preserves the privacy of auxiliary inputs. And I just want to point out that there are two distinct use cases that you could use this um, um, theorem for. Um, one is you could care about a privacy-preserving proof of integrity. Let's say I reported my taxes correctly, but I'm not going to show you, um, you know, the uh, my, my tra financial transactions throughout the year. And in this case, if you care about preserving privacy, you don't necessarily care that much about succinctness. You're willing maybe to work with very long proofs and very long verification time. Um, and there's a different uh, use case, which is you may want to compress a computation or data and you know, have some assurance that the answer is really seven and you don't need to re-execute it. And in this case, you don't necessarily care about privacy. You could care more about um, um, the length of the proof and the time it takes to verify it. Okay? So, and again, this, this is something that's very useful in things like uh, Bitcoin, where you want to compress the history and still know that it's valid. Okay, and, and we're going to look for systems that practically try to implement and achieve both of these properties, okay, if we can, at the same time. Now, suppose you want to take that marvelous theory from the, late, uh, from the early 1990s and apply it, you know, on some concrete program. So, let's think about some, some, some program that has 100 uh, assembly lines in its, in, in its program, so, but it's executed for much more times. Maybe it has some loop or something inside it, so it runs for a million cycles, which is a very short computation, right? But still, you could do stuff with it. Um, let's see what problems are you going to encounter, again, if you were in, let's say, trying to do this in 1995 or even 2000. So, and I'm sorting them in decreasing order of, um, of uh, theoretical importance, but maybe reverse order of uh, practical or engineering importance. So the first thing is going to be the prover efficiency. The biggest bottleneck in all of these systems, including the ones that we're already implementing, is the running time and space consumption of the prover. And if you look at those early results, you would see that the prover running time, um, the state of the art would give you running time that's uh, uh, the, the T, which is the number of steps of the machine, to the power one plus epsilon. But this comes with a pretty large query complexity that's log T to the one over epsilon. And if you add zero knowledge to it, you would um, complicate the coding complexity of the system because you add new ingredients like locking schemes and things like that. And um, let's decide that we call a system scalable, and this is a term I'm just inventing for the purposes of such talks, if the prover running time scales quasi-linearly um, with the number of cycles of the machine, 
Um, of course, later we care also about small constants inside this uh, tilde O tilde notation. Okay. Now, a second problem you're going to face is that of the soundness. Okay, and the soundness error, recall, is the probability that the verifier accepts a falsity. Okay? Now, there are trade-offs that are well known since the early days, again, going back to spectacular results about PCPs and things like that. So you could have the prover run much more time, and then the soundness would go up, and the query complexity would still stay, sm stay small, like Hastad's celebrated results. You could work with three queries, soundness pretty much half, uh, but the proof would be pretty long. Polynomially long, but you know, if, if you start with 2 to the 20, um, that exponent is going to be much, much larger than, let's say, 10 or probably even 100. Okay? And you could also um, increase the query complexity uh, and then also increase the soundness. Um, but again, if you look just at some, some fixed constant uh, error like half, and of course, for practical purposes, you want that, that error to be like 2 to the minus 60 or 2 to the minus 80, or even more, or even smaller than that, then you would end up with a prover exponent of 10, at least, probably much larger than that, or your query complexity would have been longer than the uh, running time. Now, you could say that this is still useful for privacy, not for compressing computation, right? But um, it turns out that when you have large query complexity, you also, and you want to keep zero knowledge, you need very, very long proofs. And uh, this would, again, blow up things and make it impractical. <coughs> so the third problem that I won't talk about uh, after this slide today is that of arithmetization. So you're going to need to convert um, your computation and its transition function into some um, set of constraints that you can build a PCP for. And typically, uh, in theoretical papers, what you um, do is uh, you start and uh, you transfer it to a Boolean circuit because Boolean circuits are very easy to work with and argue about, and then you convert the Boolean circuit uh, to some arithmetic formula. Um, and practically speaking, the number of gates you're going to end up is going to be pretty huge, like, uh, you know, 2 to the 14 per cycle, and then you need to multiply this by 2 to the 20, and this is something that both the verifier and the um, prover need to um, work with, and again, things blow up pretty quickly. So another challenge that, that we faced and, and, and are addressing in our works is, is trying to find arithmetizations from, let's say, assembly code or high-level programming languages that are much more efficient, and, and you still get uh, efficient proof systems. And the last thing, again, I'm not going to talk about it today, is engineering. You need to deal with uh, huge degree polynomials, and you want to evaluate and interpolate them quickly, and you need the fast arithmetic over certain finite fields, and you need good compilers, and so on and so forth. Yes? Where did the 2 to the 14 come from? Just, this is just uh, our experience. If you would try to take this 100 line, so we tried at first to take, let's say, a 100 line assembly code and just go through a Boolean circuit, and we ended up with uh, like 350,000 gates. You know, so that's a large number. And now we're working with like less than 100 or between 100 and 150 for the same programs, essentially. Okay, so. <coughs> And probably because of all of these um, problems, the um, security and cryptography um, uh, view of, of this whole area of the PCP theorem and its uses is summarized very well, and this is echoed in other papers, um, this uh, authoritative survey of, of reducing to practice um, proof systems. Um, so the proofs arising from the PCP theorem were so long and complicated, would have taken thousands of years to generate and check them, and we would have needed uh, more storage than there are atoms in the universe. Okay, so and if we have time, I'll show you an execution of a meaningful program with zero knowledge on this computer. So, you know, this is not true anymore. <coughs> because of these uh, hardships, another of, uh, a number of very uh, beautiful and successful alternative alternative approaches have been suggested and implemented. So I want to survey them briefly, and again, each one of them deserves a you know, talk of its own. So uh, Ishai, Kushilevitz, and Ostrovsky suggested to circumvent the need for low degree testing and PCPs of proximity and a lot of the heavy machinery of PCPs, and instead of that, use additively homomorphic encryption to achieve two things at the same time. So first of all, you can hide the queries and make it harder for the prover to cheat. 
And um, at the same time, you also don't need any more um, low degree testing and things like that because the properties of the homomorphic encryption are forcing the prover to stick to some uh, low degree polynomial. And this has been successfully implemented, um, ginger, pepper. Um, another suggestion, this time together with Amit Sahai, was to use MPC, which is a, a more elaborate construction, but you can do an MPC in the head. So the prover now is going to run a multi-party secure computation, write down the transcript, commit to it, and then the verifier asks him to um, open a random uh, portion of it. And, and this, again, has been implemented very recently, and it works uh, very efficiently. Um, Another approach, uh, proofs for muggles, scales down the celebrated IP equals P space theorem to the case of polybounded provers. And um, it's very efficient. And another thing is does, it does not assume any cryptography at all. It only uses interaction, which is great. Um, but it only works for um, uh, a subclass of, of P, of polynomial time. <coughs> Again, implemented as well. The most successful and most deployed system is, is that based on, on pairings over elliptic curves and knowledge of exponent assumptions. Um, it gets you proofs that are very, very short, like 300 bytes at uh, an estimated level of security of 128 bits. Um, the problem is, is the setup, which is not Arthur Merlin, and we'll talk about it later. There's a trusted setup that is problematic. And it's been implemented in many things. Uh, um, one last thing, which is pretty recent, is to use discrete logarithm problem to get a succinct proof that now does not need a trusted setup. Um, it is Arthur Merlin. And it's, again, been implemented. Oh, and one more thing is to take any one of these systems and apply the idea of incrementally verifiable computation to break up a, a computation into chunks and sort of have the prover prove to you that he ran a verifier in previous chunks and they all succeeded. And this uh, reduces the length of, of setup keys. Um, again, been implemented. So here is just a very brief summary of the... Yes? consider the post-quantum versions of this problem? PQ is post-quantum. So let's, yeah, good, great question. <laughs> so uh, here's a bunch of properties that are useful. Universality means that it works for all of, uh, at least NP, hopefully next. Scalable means prover running time is quasi-linear, uh, non-interactive after a setup or a common reference string. Uh, succinct, you want it to be uh, very easy to verify proofs. Uh, you want the setup to be Arthur Merlin, so everything is public and transparent. Uh, you want it to be zero knowledge. And the last thing is post-quantum resistant. And you can see that, um, you know, as we go down, things pretty much improve. Um, let's just put here PC, and all of these are implemented stuff. Now, PCP theory around 95 gave you post-quantum and zero knowledge and everything, but not, wasn't scalable. Um, the way I got into this was into this whole question of implementing started by, by doing some theory with Madhu Sudan and noticing that you can make the PCP scalable, but at the time we didn't know how to get, you could either get zero knowledge or you could get scalable PCPs, but not both at the same time. Um, so, but a, a year ago, we, we together with uh, Alessandro Chiesa, Ariel Gabizon, and Madal Zvirza, we published a paper where you can get all of these things, including scalable zero knowledge, and I'll talk about this in the second part. And in the third part, I'll show you some numbers about an implementation of the PCP stuff without uh, zero knowledge. And that's a recent work um, that's posted on, on, on ePrint, 11 co-authors, so I won't go through the names. And uh, if we have time, I'll show you some, some numbers about the system that we're now, uh, uh, you know, finessing um, together with uh, Ido Bentov, Inon Khorush, and... Uh, that should be an R. It's uh, Michael Ryabtsev uh, sitting back there. Um, so uh, that hopefully will post soon. Good. So we finish with the motivating discussion. Any questions so far? Let me drink some water while you think about questions. Okay. 
So let's go back to those concrete challenges, and we'll only talk about two of them. <coughs> Starting with the scalable prover. So as I said, um, if you looked at things, let, let's say 95, you would see that you have this trade-off that's not that convenient, especially when you scale it down to small numbers. And if you add um, um, zero knowledge, then things really blow up. And again, just contemplate the case. Suppose you want soundness error uh, of 128 bits. You're going to need at least a uh, number of queries to be 128 queries. And then that means that the number of queries is at least 2 to the 7. So if you need, raise that to power 6, you're already at 2 to the 42, which is 4 uh, terabytes. And it's, of course, a lot more than that. Um, OK. So in light of this, we really want to say that a system is scalable if the prover running time is scalable in both the um, number of cycles of the machine and the um, number of queries. So as I said, we, we already, back in uh, about a decade ago, we already had theoretical scalable PCPs, even with succinct verifiers. And you can me even make the query complexity go down to be a constant. Um, with slightly longer proofs, theoretically longer proofs, practically they're much longer. Um, and last year we posted this, this result that gives you scalable zero knowledge using uh, something we call a duplex PCP, and I'll talk about it in a minute. Um, the, pro the prover running time is now really quasi-linear. Um, it has perfect zero knowledge. It's coding complexity, meaning the amount of changes you need to make to a PCP prover in order to make it zero knowledge is very minimal. And uh, another nice thing, it's a special case of a new model that seems very interesting and also very useful if you want to um, do things practical um, in the PCP world. So that's going to be our next topic. And to explain how we get scalable zero knowledge, we need to first of all recall how we get scalable PCP without zero knowledge. And for that, we need to talk about what is a PCP of proximity and some other preliminary definitions. So a PCP of pro proximity is a proof system for checking or verifying that a code word is close to, um, sorry, that a a purported code word is actually close to an error correcting code. So in this model, you have the verifier making queries to a pair. One is the purported code word, which we'll denote by W, and the other uh, member of the pair is this uh, PCP of proximity, PCPP. And um, <clears throat> what we care about is we want uh, the proof length, this, uh, the length of the auxiliary proof to be as small as possible, and we want the number of queries to be small for a good level of soundness. Soundness means that if your delta far, let's say, 1 over 10 far in Hamming distance, in relative Hamming distance, then the rejection probability is, let's say, at least 1 half. OK. And we'll say that a PCPP system is linear if the prover, um, if the code is linear, and the function, the prover, the mapping from um, code words to proofs is a linear mapping. <coughs> Now, a good starting point for um, building algebraic PCPs is this language that's been implicit in pretty much a lot of the works on, on constructing PCPs. Um, and we'll call it uh, linear algebraic CSP. So, I mean, I think this is a very simple explanation of how a PCP works. So even if we don't get, even if you don't get from this talk how we get scalable zero knowledge, if you just have this... Uh, um, you know, mental image of how you build an efficient PCP, that will be already great. So what is this language? You really are given an instance is just a pair of error correcting codes and a mapping between words in the first code to the second code. Okay, that's G. And two parameters. Q is the query complexity and, and delta is a, is a distance parameter. And what, what, is, what do we know about such an instance? The codes are linear, both of them, and they have good distance. Um, G has to be a local map, meaning that every entry of its output can be computed by querying at most Q entries of the input. And the last thing is the distance property, which says that both C0 and C1, and even if you add to C1 the image of C0 under G, this whole um, space doesn't have to be a linear space has relative distance at least delta. So it's a good error-correcting code. 
And an instance is in the language if and only if there exists uh, an assignment, which is this W0 in the first code, such that when you apply G to it, you land in the second code in C1. Okay? So, suppose you want a PCP system for such, a, um, for such an instance. So here's a canonical PCP, and pretty much all algebraic PCPs work like this. So your proof, your PCP is really going to be a quadruple. It's going to be the pair of code words W0 and W1, and two PCPs of proximity for each one of the codes. <coughs> the verifier just checks two things. First of all, he checks the consistency between W0, W1, and the mapping G. And this requires only Q queries to W0 and one query to W1, which are randomly located, okay? And you may repeat this a few times to boost your uh, soundness. The second thing you do is you apply a proximity test. You apply a PCP verifier to each one of the two codes. And just check that W0 is close to the code C0 and W1 is close to C1. And for this, you need the two auxiliary proofs, Pi0 and Pi1. Now, completeness follows from the definition. And soundness uh, follows from this lose-lose uh, situation. So suppose X is not in the language, okay? So the prover is really t torn between two bad things that he can try. Well, if either W0 or W1 is not close enough to the relevant code, then the prover is toasted because of the PCP, PCPP verifier, right? We'll reject. Otherwise, W0 and W1 are close to their respective codes, but we know that because of the distance property, G of W0 must be very far from W1 because otherwise uh, the instance would have been satisfiable and X would have been in the language. So now this means that the consistency test will fail with high probability. And this is really how a PCP works. So what we really did is push the complexity into the construction of the PCP of proximity. But that seems to be a simpler problem because we're dealing with well understood codes uh, and we can just focus on that problem and it doesn't have any more computational complexity, it's just a question about coding and locally testable codes and things like that. Okay, so, so far we described the canonical PCP and I just want to say that to make it scalable, so uh, you're going to use um, Reed solomon codes which have a scalable PCPP, a scalable linear PCPP, so the prover is, runs in quasi-linear time and is a linear function. Okay, and another thing you're going to use is that you can actually reduce computational integrity scalably and efficiently um, to this good starting point. And it's not hard to see the first, uh, the first line here that you can reduce it in poly time to LACSP, but it requires more work to make it scalable. So the witness map, given a witness to a CI instance, it's a little bit more tricky to map it scalably to an instance of the, um, of the linear algebraic CSP. So if we go back to this uh, general canonical PCP for linear algebraic CSP, and we just plug in Reed-Solomon codes everywhere, um, you know, these uh, purple reddish thing are just uh, the modifications you need to do. So you instantiate this canonical system with Reed-Solomon codes, Reed-Solomon PCPs of proximity, and um, you just, that's pretty much it, okay? And everything becomes uh, scalable, succinct, efficient, okay? Now, suppose we want to add zero knowledge to this system. So, for that, we're going to need to look a little bit deeper into this reduction. How do we reduce an instance, how do we reduce an instance of the computational integrity problem to an instance of the linear algebraic CSP? And moreover, we're going to focus really on the witness map. So suppose I know an assignment, that's at, so I know some non-deterministic witness like passwords and medical information that lead the machine to, you know, give the output seven. So I have this uh, information with me. How do I convert it to a uh, witness for the PCP? And then, which is going to be really this Reed solomon code word, and then once we talk about that, we're going to ask, uh, how do we get it to be zero knowledge, okay? So, you start with an execution trace, which is pretty much just writing down how the machine 
um, you know, evolves from its starting point to its end point uh, and, and gets to this output of seven. It's non-deterministic. Well, the prover picks an evolution that leads him to that. So, right, the witness contains uh, exactly the, the choices, right? So you, you write this uh, um, execution trace that would lead you to the claimed output. And now um, what you do is you apply arithmetization um, to the transition function of the machine M. So if you think about two consecutive states, they, even in a non-deterministic machine, they must um, satisfy a certain relation, right? The relation contains only those pairs that are legitimate according to the program. Okay, so you take that relation and you write a bunch of low degree polynomials that are satisfied only by pairs um, that lie in that relation. Okay, and that's arithmetization, separate topic, we won't talk about it today. But suppose you did that. So you end up with this uh, function G, which is a low degree polynomial, a bivariate polynomial. I'm simplifying things because it really has more than two variables. but. Um, um, you have this uh, bivariate polynomial that will vanish if and only if the current state and the next state comply with the um, transition function. Good. So what does it mean for the execution trace to be good and valid and prove to you that the output is correct? It just means that for every um, step, um, SI and SI plus 1 belong to the relation, which means that G vanishes on them. We use algebra, so true is equivalent to 0. Okay. And once you have this, um, the way you get to an instance of the linear algebraic CSP goes like this. You take the execution trace and you compute its low degree extension. So you, what you do is you interpolate first and you get the polynomial. And then you take that polynomial and you evaluate it on more points. Let's say, uh, you know, 64 more times. So you started with t uh, elements and you ended up with 64 t elements. But the degree of this polynomial is only t. <clears throat> and then um, you notice, and again, this requires a little bit more work, that if you apply g to w0, you will still get, if you started with w0 being an evaluation of a low-degree polynomial, you will still get that w1 is a low-degree polynomial, but its degree went up a little bit. It went up by a factor that is equal to the degree of g. And finally, you notice that um, x is good if and only if you have these two code words that vanish on all time steps. But algebraically, a polynomial vanishes at a bunch of points if and only if you can divide it by the polynomial that splits on those points. So you apply this division, and then you really get that your two code words are w0 um, that belongs to a code of rate O0, like 1 over 64, and then um, the target rate for the second code is uh, O1 minus um, O0. So, um, why is this not zero knowledge? Well, if the verifier gets to query the points of W0, the verifier could learn the non-deterministic witnesses, the passwords, the medical information, and so on because W0 really contains an execution trace, including non-deterministic choices. <clears throat> so the idea is going to be that, since we're working with uh, univariate polynomials, and univariate polynomials are TYs independent, so just like in uh, Adi's s s secret sharing, we could use the TYs independence of degree T polynomials to um, make individual queries look uh, completely random. So in particular, we're just going to allow W0 to be not degree t0, but twice. So the prover, what he's going to do is write an execution trace and then just pick randomness for another t um, steps and just fill that out. So we doubled the rate of both codes. And the point is that for any set of queries that you make, as long as you don't ask about the first t um, positions um, um, in this code word, you re your distribution is completely uniformly random over all tuples of field elements. So it has, this is perfect zero knowledge. 
And if you worry about W1, it's not so bad. If you want to answer or simulate queries to W1, you just have to look at their pre-images in W0, which costs you only a factor Q more, and randomly select those and, and, and simulate uh, W1 by, by applying this map G. So it's not hard to show that this gives you perfect zero knowledge. <clears throat> and let's talk about the coding complexity. And so this was the canonical, um, um, this was the, uh, sorry, this was the way we did the reduction from uh, co computation to, uh, to this uh, pair of uh, code words. And uh, all we need to do is add some randomness, so we really don't need to change the code a lot, and the rate doesn't change much. You pay with a factor two, that's it. So, this works but for one problem, which is that um, the two PCPs of proximity may leak information, right, about the, uh, about the assignments and about the non-deterministic witness. And not only may they do it, but in this particular PCP of proximity, they actually do leak information. So it seems that we didn't get zero knowledge yet. And the idea is going gonna, is gonna to be that we're going to use masking to hide this information. And this is going to call for a new model which, in which the prover really writes down the PCP in two rounds. First, he writes down um, W0 and W1. And then he writes down the PCPs of proximity. So let's see how it works. In the first round, um, the prover is going to write down the, um, the assignment. And he's going to pick two more uniformly random um, Reed Solomon code words of the relevant uh, rates. And then the verifier is going to send uh, public randomness, two field elements. And now, the second round, the prover is going to compute the PCPs of proximity for the random linear combinations of uh, the original word, wi, um, multiplied by alpha, plus the masking randomness. And it's not hard to see that, uh, okay, it's, it's not easy, but you can show that this now has perfect zero knowledge. <coughs> And th these are the modifications you would do, uh, you know, again, in Magenta. These are the modifications you would do to the original canonical PCP to make it a PCP, sorry, a zero-knowledge um, um, two-shot or two-round or duplex uh, PCP. Good. So the model that this uses is something we call interactive oracle proofs. So let's just uh, recall that we have uh, interactive proof, single prover, that is equal to p-space. Uh, we have uh, MIP, which is uh, two non-communicating provers. We have a PCP model, which is equivalent to NEXP. A uh, recent model is IPCP, where you have a single um, oracle, but you also allow the verifier to interact with the prover after having uh, oracle access to the, um, to the proof. And the new model, which was also independently called probabilistically checkable interactive proof by uh, Rothblum, Roth, Rothblum, Rothblum, and uh, Reingold, um, allows you to interact with an oracle that provides, uh, sorry, uh, with a prover that provides oracles interactively. He first sends the first oracle, then gets randomness, sends the second oracle, and so on and so forth. So here's an informal definition. An IOP is an interactive proof where V is not required to read the messages in entirety, um, but it may query them at random locations. <coughs> and IOPs are very useful for practical implementations. So we already talked about two round uh, perfect zero knowledge for NP. In recent work, we extended this to cover all of NEXP. Um, you also get something that you, we do not know how to achieve in PCP world. You get proofs whose length is O times T in bits with constant soundness and constant query complexity, which is something we can't get in, uh, we don't know how to get yet with PCPs. And you can, if you're worried about the interaction, how you would make them non-interactive, so pretty much the same technology that you would use to make um, PCPs non-interactive could be used here as well, with no great loss in scalability or statistical zero knowledge. <coughs> so I'm going to skip over the soundness, okay? 
And I just want to go back to uh, some high-level discussion. So who needs, you know, we're building these things in code, who needs them? I mean, the world is full of trusted parties, like banks or big companies, and <clears throat> you only need encryption to work with them, right? They, they keep all the data for you, and they do it pretty well, you know, and they've been doing, trusted parties have been trusted for millennia, and they work pretty well. If you want to add something like cryptographic, uh, computational integrity and privacy, it's going to be very costly from a computer side of view. Um, though, of course, uh, a lot of people will argue that the costs of trust are also huge, right? Lawyers and regulators, auditors and things like that. Good. Another thing is that trusted parties want to stay trusted parties, so they really want to keep keeping your data for you. So, you know, who's going to pay for this? Uh, I mean, outside of research, who wants this? Luckily, there's Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies, because there it's very clear that you really, really, really need and crave for cryptographic proofs of computational integrity, and um, we get a lot of uh, you know, good reception and interest from this community. Okay, for obvious reasons. So, I mean, we were working on this for several years and looking for applications, and, and then we came to the Bitcoin conference in May 2013 and said, hey, you know, you could use it to improve various things in Bitcoin, like compress the blockchain, or prove to others that you have enough coins as you claim you have, or improve privacy. At the same time, um, uh, a team from John Hopkins showed a very nice construction that adds anonymity to Bitcoin using RSA accumulators. And we joined up and published a paper showing the first decentralized anonymous payment system um, that hides, it's, it works like Bitcoin, so you see the whole blockchain, but you hide payer, payee, and payment amount. And it uses, right now, it uses uh, this knowledge of exponent-based uh, uh, construction that's called also a ZK-SNARK. And we later on co-founded a company to implement it, and this company even launched, launched its cryptocurrency two months ago. So you can follow it online. Now, if you think about what would computational integrity and privacy systems need in the blockchain world. So you really could see that each one of these properties is really, really important. Universality would allow you to build new programs, you know, like Ethereum allows you contracts and uh, general Turing complete uh, programs. You would want to cover those with uh, computational integrity and privacy. Succinctness would allow you to, to have, uh, you know, blockchains be very succinct and not uh, have everyone replicate huge databases. Non-interactiveness is important to prevent various attacks or, you know, blocking off uh, interactions in the middle. Scalability of, is, of course, the biggest bottleneck because you want people to be able to run transactions eventually on their smartphones within, you know, a second. Uh, privacy is very important. Um, and transparency is also important. So uh, you want to deploy these systems in a way that the public can easily trust and not have any qualms about. And the biggest criticism that we're receiving about Zcash is this reliance on the non-Arthur Merlin setup which, uh, if it is compromised, offers the attacker a, basically uh, a license to uh, write checks to any amount, and zero knowledge will even uh, you know, hide this, this, this attack from, from others for a long time. Um, so we published a first uh, full reduction from assembly code to PCP, including the nefarious parts of Reed Solomon proximity testing and PCPP composition. Now, really what we did is we used interactive or uh, IOPs instead of PCPPs, but it's just, uh, you know, if you really want to use the full space of opening up a PCPP, it's the same code. It will just uh, run a little bit longer and use more space. Um, so, morally, it is a PCP. And this is joint work with uh, a lot of people, 11 co-authors. <coughs> It's part of this uh, pretty large-scale effort, so it's been going on for six years. I never thought it would take so long, and of course, continuing. So, right, like this saying, in theory, practice and theory are the same. Um, I spent a large part of my ERC um, grant to this, and you know, I'm very happy about it and thankful to the ERC. So let me show you some, some concrete things. How much time do I have? 
Three minutes, good. So here, uh, think about this very simple statement, no subset, uh, um, it's the subset, prob subset sum problem, but the co-NP version. So I'm proving to you that no subset of an array sums up to a target, okay? And we ran two different programs. One of them is very uh, time consuming, but uses very little memory. And the other one uses uh, a lot of memory, but is quadratically more efficient. So here are some numbers. Um, on the left here, we have the um, running time as a function, um, the prover running time as a function of the number of cycles of the machine at different security levels, one bit and 80 bit security. And here we have the verifier running time. And as you can see, the verifier running time is very small and also scales very favorably. So this is log number of cycles. So even if you, would to, you were to run the computation for two to the 50 cycles, your verification <coughs> would have been, <coughs> sorry, less than a second. Of course, the proving time would have been much more uh, costly. Um, down below here, we have the proof length, both in, in, in the query complexity and uh, the space complexity of the prover. Okay, the jump is because it's a recursive construction. Up to here, you use two levels of recursion, and here you go to three levels of recursion, so that's why you get this drop. But you see that the drop is just in here, and you don't see it as much here. Um, so the running time is not affected that much. Okay. What's more interesting is that um, our compiler was efficient enough so that the um, extra costs you pay for dealing with memory um, still um, was less uh, costly than... Um, okay, so this is the sorting-based execution, which is more efficient in running time, but you have to deal with memory. And as you can see um, here, the prover running time versus array size um, gets better for the sorting-based execution uh, pretty quickly. Okay. So I wanted uh, just to show you some numbers about uh, this new system that we're now, um, you know, finessing. And here it's already, you know, a real-world application. So this is, the, pr the statement now is, I check the blacklist. Um, so all you know is the hash of a blacklist, but I'm proving to you that the data element does not appear there. And this is already practically useful, like for FACTA compliance, uh, regulation, airlines could prove that they don't have any problematic citizens in their flight list, and so on. So formally what you're proving is everyone knows this Merkle root and some data element, and you're proving that you ran over the whole data set and you checked all nodes, and none of them is this, uh, is this problematic instance. Um, so we can compute the running time, and, uh, um, and th this is not measured yet, but this is uh, because we just didn't have time to execute it yet, but this is what we expect is going to happen uh, in terms of uh, um, proof length. Um, so here we have soundness, which is provable soundness, and here we have security. Oh, okay, I'll just end by saying that if you use uh, security, uh, your proof lengths are going to be like, um, you know, like 200 to 300 kilobytes, and uh, um, at the level of security of uh, 80 bits for practical purposes. So I hope to have conveyed that computational integrity and privacy are really important problems for long-term viability of decentralized systems. And they could also be potentially useful for centralized, trusted parties. Um, and they require all the properties that are delivered by things like the PCP theorem and, and various tweaks on it that were already known since the 1990s. And I hope to have showed you that Looking at the theory to practice question is not only a practical question, but also leads to new models, new questions, and new applications. So thank you very much. You discussed several ways in which you could use uh, uh, the Zcash technology to improve over uh, Bitcoin. But there's one aspect which is really bothersome, and I wonder whether you could improve on it, and this is the uh, proof of work. 
the huge consumption of uh, electricity and the huge expenses. And all you want to do is to prove to somebody that you have a lot of computing power. Did you think about a way how to uh, use your technology in order to show that you could have executed a very large number of steps even though you didn't uh, run it? So, in short, the answer is no, but I'm trying to think now, like, uh, how would I attack it? So, suppose I had this huge computer, um, I think. So, I'm not sure that would, uh, like, without actually running it, it won't be any more so much of a finite resource. And also, okay. I run it only for one second. Uh, in Bitcoin, I'm uh, running it for uh, 10 minutes on average, and, and I have to solve something. But if I can just uh, not solve it exactly, but solve uh, an approximate uh, solution, I may be able to prove that I have a lot of computing power, even though I ran it for only one second and saved 99.9% uh, .9 of the electricity needed. But then I get a factor, uh, if it's one second out of, let's say, a thousand seconds, I can, you know, do it a thousand times and prepare it. Um. I didn't, know, I didn't say it's a complete solution, but it's an approach how, without actually uh, running a full computation, you want to show that you could have succeeded. Okay, I, uh, I need to think offline about it. I'm worried, first of all, whether you, know, you need proofs for that, really, or are these kinds of proofs. And second, if it really would... Um, be you know viable in a decentralized setting you know when you can attack it by various means I, I don't know it still leaves open the question of who actually gets their uh, bitcoins or zcash or whatever uh, because it only proves that various entities have certain distribution of computing power now you need some kind of uh, randomized selection uh, process based on those numbers in order to right. assign the new bitcoins to one of those groups Right. Most cryptocurrencies currently use a monetary policy that, um, you know, rewards people with a lot of either hardware or a combination of hardware and electricity. This is, everyone knows it's an unfortunate solution. There are already, so Ethereum is moving to proof of stake. I know that people are sort of, you know, looking to see what will happen. That, that's going to reward rich people, right? Because proof of stake means the more money you have, the richer you get. Um, you could say that Proof of work also rewards it because the more money you have, the more uh, you know hardware you could buy. Right. So you know, uh, I would say that if someone finds a really good solution to how to uh, decentralize, um, you know, core things like money and politics, when there's incentive to change everything, including the rules, this would be you know a solution to many of humanity's problems, really. But uh, it's it's what. You know, well, you've done some things in the past, so, uh, you know. Yeah, but it's a daunting problem, right? But it's really, like, if you could really decentralize in a fair way, um, let's say something like Bitcoin, that would be just, uh, you know, amazing for humanity. Hopefully, you know. Okay. <laughs>